Hello, good evening. I'm Oral Gibbs, and welcome to Oral Gibbs to Speaking of Everything. I will make that mistake. This is Speaking of Everything, not the live show, but the recorded program. And with me this evening, I have none other than Dr. Jurgensen. How are you doing, Doctor? Very well, thank you. Very good to be back with you on the show. Well, it's good to show. have you here. I haven't seen you in quite a while. That's right. What have you been doing in the last years? Well, uh, continuing the work of psychiatry and, you know, uh, making people more and more aware of the importance of uh, emotional health and how they need to um, manage their well-being. I think that's the essence of what I do every day. Right. And it continues. It's quite amazing, though, because um, I asked you before the program how long since you've been here, and you said 10 years. 10 years, uh-huh. It goes really fast, huh? Yes, it does. Are you, what surprised you most in the last 10 years since you've been in St. Martin? I have been surprised at the, um, the number of younger people uh, as the lay people would say, uh -huh. beginning to suffer from a nervous breakdown. Really? The, yeah, the younger people. When I say younger, I mean late teenage, 17 to 21. That is the kind of age we're seeing, for example. Uh, people, uh, an increase in suicidal attempts, for example. Uh, and that is of concern. That, that's concern. Because uh, the young years of your life are supposed to be vibrant years. I remember when I was a late teenager, I really was <laughs> involved in everything, uh, back before those, <laughs> car, you know, the yeah. internet and all that. And, and here we are, you know, um, teenagers, and do not seem to have the emotional strength to be able to withstand the modern day pressures. And that's of concern to me. Because, you know, uh -huh. young people are not only the future, you know, we like to call them the future of our society, they are the present. They're the ones that give really a lot of meaning as to what is, it is to celebrate life and to be enthusiastic and idealistic. And when we have that group of people now not really being available yeah. to show those attributes for the society, it's, uh, it's of concern. And, I'm and sure to other people too, not only to myself. And, and you've been practicing psychiatry now for quite some time. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, over 25 years. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, when, you, when, when I hear someone like you, describe what you just described, that's a uh, reason for concern right now in St. Martin. Yes, yes. It is not only in St. Martin, I believe. You ask me because I'm working here. But it's, it's when you look at uh, the Caribbean, it's, it's a, a similar pattern that you will see across the board, perhaps internationally as well. Part of it has to do with uh, the fact that, you know, the, uh, the drug intake oh, by okay. this age group, and so they are impaired, their, their mental functioning is not as clear and um, focused mm. uh, as long ago. And uh, that, that's of concern. The other thing, of course, too, is the preoccupation with the devices, the <laughs> internet, and so on. And so losing the, um, losing the skills of relationship, you know, the one-on-one -on -one talk and so on, the, the relationship. And really, relationships are very, very important to your well-being. So if you, if you don't have a real good positive relationship, then there's Correct. a problem, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because in relationships, uh, you meet your emotional needs, many of your emotional needs. The, the four basic ones, for example, to, to the most important one, emotional need that we have, is the need to love and to be loved. Where do you find that? In relationship. Yeah. Uh, the need to feel good about yourself, too, comes from feedback from uh, significant persons in your relationship. The need to be free, too, uh, you exercise within relationships. Mm. And of course, the most important one, the need to belong. So all these things are impacted by um, the, the behavior and the habits of young people today and affect relationship, affect their well-being. Yeah. And, and the thing is, you've got to be really strong, because sometimes a lot of young people feel like uh, their surroundings, that they're not accepted. Yes. And then you've got to be really strong to survive it. Sure, yeah, that is true. And of course, the most important part of that environment is your home, yeah. you know, um, and relationship with parents and siblings. Uh, you have to, a lot of homes now uh, are suffering a significant breakdown, you know, where uh, the quality of relationships within that home are not as strong as they used to be before. For example, um, uh, the extended family yeah. is being eroded. Um, I'm saying this uh, to sort of point out what needs to be done right. and not to stay in the negative mode, but to say these are the problems and how we need to 
um, put measures in place to correct them. Uh, I think um, an awareness is where you begin, to be aware, well, yes, it, it is a problem. In homes, for example, a very simple thing that uh, might help to correct the, the problem with relationships is an insisting that um, every other day, or at least on the weekend, families share a meal together. That may seem very simple, but it could go a long way towards building relationships with family. I'm speaking to a lot of young people who tell me that um, teenagers, no, they, they don't have a, week, uh, a meal together in family. They, there's a, the meal is cooked, but everybody serves themselves. They go before the television, or they go in their rooms, mm -hmm. on the internet, and this does not help uh, relationships within the family. So I'm putting forward a simple measure to our listeners. Right. That yeah. everybody's in family, share a meal, especially on the weekend together. It does a lot towards building relationships and improving one's well-being. So it, it, the foundation is a strong family, you're saying? Yes, the yes, I think so, a very yeah. strong family. Yeah. And, and the thing is that um, when you look at an island like St. Martin, it's a pretty wealthy island. Well, it appears very wealthy. There's a lot of beautiful cars, nice buildings. People see a lot of nice things. You see a lot of visitors coming to the island. And there's a lot of pressure on people, too, to, to be like a visitor sometimes, not realizing that the visitor is on vacation, they're here for a while, but you're on the island where you have to work, and they don't consider. Sometimes they get confused between work and play and, and all the different aspects of that. Right, of course, and that, that has to to do with appreciating your own culture and um, being who you are. You know, um, it's very important. There are many sort of cultural things that we could talk about that affect well-being, you know? And yeah. uh, a, um, a country that appreciates its culture, where uh, young people, for example, um, are respectful towards their peers, respectful towards their families, respectful in school, bringing back some of these old qualities. This is what we should base our, our striving for well-being on, rather than on what we see in visitors. As you say, that is not a, that is not a realistic way to look at oneself. Well, you know, this is a, St. Martin is a small Las Vegas. And I realize when I go to Las Vegas for, for business meetings, and I speak with people, especially cab drivers and people that work in the hotel there, and I compare it with St. Martin, I see so many similarities, you know, in, in terms of behavior. In terms of we have a lot of people that are not from here, Las Vegas, so a lot of people that are not from there. And also, the, the, the people that are there want to be a part of the activity all the time. You can't do that. If you do that, you get in a lot of trouble. Right. Mm -hmm. And we are seeing that more and more in St. Martin, you know, where people are turned into gambling, and, and then they have no money, and then they have problems, and then that creates enormous pressure on the individual and on their family. Yes, indeed. And I, I want to say that I see quite uh, a few um, clients with that problem, um, say addiction to gambling. Right. And this is not only in males, but, but many females, you know, uh, addicted to gambling. And of course, it causes a breakdown in family life because for one thing, the resources are kind of spent there. Right. And there's very little now to be spent on essential things that the family need. And of course, the, an addiction always creates a kind of tension, which again affects relationships. If a, purpose, if a, a person is focused on something else, they have less time to spend on you know, listening to their, their family members, taking care of their needs, understanding. The focus is to, you know, to get to that um, gambling casino. And uh, yeah. it's an addiction, really. And, and individuals like that, again, can be helped. For every kind, I think, is for, for every kind of um, problem that we're facing, we need always to think of a solution. Yeah. And I think that persons who are addicted to gambling need to know that there is help available. You, you, I, you, I tend you, to think that some people available. can't be helped. No, no, no. There is help available, yeah. and the person, but the person must want it and come forward to seek that help so, and must admit that they have the problem. Okay. Many times they do not admit. So unless you don't admit, you really ask. The reason why I said that I think some people can't be helped, I know a few people, and their family has spoken to them, mm -hmm. and they are like in complete denial that they're doing nothing wrong. Right, yes. And if, you, if that person stays in that state of mind, 
I don't think you can ever help that person. Indeed, I mean, I'm, I'm right. I'm a person, but I mean, you're the professor. Yeah, but, but there are certain interventions that can be made. Uh -huh. um, sometimes it is true that the person almost has to leave, reach rock bottom point to be able to come out of it and to admit that they need help. Sometimes that happens. Yeah. But there are also certain interventions that can be made by different members of the society. It doesn't always have to be a counselor, psychiatrist, or psychologist. Um, many people go to their pastors, for example. That could be an entry into help in this island where many people are religious-minded. You don't need to always say, hey, you need to go and see a counselor, but hey, talk to your pastor. Begin that way. If it yeah. cannot be handled at that level, then you move up to a counselor, a psychologist, psychiatrist. There is help available, but one has got to recognize it mm -hmm. and come for it. No, let me ask you this and tell me if it's true. I was speaking to a, a doctor that's not a psychiatrist, and the doctor said to me one day that it's more difficult to treat women when they have a, a gambling or a substance problem than men. Is that really true? In my experience, I haven't found it that way. As a matter of fact, you will find that the women, because they are more of the caregivers in family, are quicker to realize that they need help. When the resources have really begun to be depleted, yeah. the mother who has to you know, spend that for, for children's needs, spend that on food, would come to the conclusion earlier oh, okay. that, look, I need this, this, this can't continue. Whereas with a man who does not really uh, involve himself with those minute details of family life, they tend to take longer. That, that's been my experience. And at the same time, yeah. I, I think it's more serious when you have a woman because of her connection to the home and the children, right? Indeed, sure, indeed. So um, fortunately, they, as I say, they are more easily come for help than the men. So but mm -hmm. with great difficulty for both sexes. So I assume that once the person have exhausted all other avenues, then the, mm -hmm. the doctor like you comes into play. Yes, right? yes. It sometimes comes down to that. Yeah. Right. And does it require medication in those cases? No, no, no. Um, gambling, no. no it no. cannot be cured by medication. <laughs> <laughs> A psychiatrist, of course, can prescribe medication. Right. That's part of what we do. But it's not one of the situations where you would use medication. It's more um, a, a talking treatment, we can put it that way. Psychotherapy, okay. you know, uh, um, uh, something that requires a change within, a decision to be made. Um, and you help the person to see that they can make a change in their life. That's so. correct, yes. Right. And, and to show them that it is possible. Sometimes people do give up in those situations. They say, well, that's it. I'm spoiled. I, there's no turning back. And sometimes just to say, hey, there is help. Mm -hmm. You know, if you open up yourself to it, think about it. Well, you know, Doctor, uh, it, it's amazing because uh, I had you many times in the program, also in the live show. And uh, when you look at your practice, and earlier you told me ab about the issue with young people and mental illness, are there other areas f for concern on, on the island right now? Sure. I'm going to mention one that's culturally accepted, mm -hmm. and that's alcoholism. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I work uh, at, at the St. Martin Medical Center. Uh, you see quite a few cases of alcoholism coming in through the emergency room. Really? Yes. No, they may not come in as um, psychiatric problems, right. but uh, problems that affect their general health. Because, you know, alcohol is a substance that, when abused, can affect almost every organ in the body. So it affects your heart. It affects your um, stomach, of course. Uh, you can get... Um, ulcers, it affects your sexual potency, yeah. it affects your central nervous system, and so uh, you see quite a few cases of alcoholism being treated in the hospital on the general ward, what we call the med surge ward. And of course you know too that we have the turning point, which is the rehabilitation ward, not, not for treating these acute physical problems, but for once a person has settled down from their physical problem, to, to rehabilitate so that that same thing doesn't happen again. Oh, okay. So this, this is a significant problem. That is difficult because alcohol is something that's uh, culturally accepted. You know? It's legal. And it's legal. And everybody says, well, you know, it, you, when you try and say, well, look, it's a problem, they say, you're talking about alcohol, but everybody drinks. So it's, you know? And, but it can be, it's a problem. Well, uh, now, we're not saying that people should become teetotalers. That means 
nobody drinks, don't take an alcoholic drink. No, medically speaking, there's nothing we can say to support that uh, everyone should be a teetotaler. But it's the abuse of alcohol. And how do you know you're abusing alcohol? When you have a problem with it. It's as simple as that. If you have a problem um, that when, when you take one drink, you cannot uh, stop yourself from going for the second and the third and the fourth, that is something you have to do something about. Oh, okay. You have lost control of your intake of alcohol. Uh, so the definition of alcoholism has changed over the years. You know, we had a view of alcoholism in the past where or the person in the street in the gutter, um, uh, drunk. Uh, no, no, it's not, that, that is a problem too. That's an extreme problem. But really, it's the loss of control over alcohol yeah, because that you, you need to. You have well-educated people with good jobs mm -hmm. going to work every day, but they're still alcoholics. Yes, yes, indeed. Yes, and uh, you know, um, but it does affect, you can say, they're going to work, but how are they functioning? You know, um, because alcoholism and the loss of control over alcohol does affect your, your ability to focus. And you will find, for example, yes, people are going to work, but when they have a problem with alcoholism, they leave early. So they're less productive on the work. They arrive late uh, at work and stay for shorter hours. Mm -hmm. Uh, it has, takes its toll on family life, too, because it affect, affects relationship, and um, particularly the effect of alcohol on sexuality, and uh, the fact that um, it produces potency uh, in men and uh, so frigidity, say, in, in women. It will affect the marital relationship and relationship it, in intimate relationships. So it is something to look at, of mm -hmm. course. It's no simple solution as to how you you deal with a cultural uh, yeah. situation that's accepted, but I think we need a lot of education programs. And to say, yes, alcohol, you can, you can drink alcohol uh, safely medically, but you ought to know when, recognize when it has turned from social use into abuse and seek help. So basically what you're saying is when you had a first glass and you have to go back for next yeah, one. Yeah, that's one, a problem. You're control, then you have then Yeah, you have out of problem. control. Yeah. Yes, you, you, you need to look at that. Don't say, oh, but I'm all right. I, oh. I don't get drunk. I, you don't see me out in the street staggering. <laughs> uh -huh. That's not a, a problem. Is a loss of control. Anything else you think that we need to know about um, that is important to know what's going on on this island? Well, yes. I, I always like to talk about the stigma attached to to mental illness mm. and the need to, con con on a continual basis, do something about it. Because what it does is prevents people from mm. coming forward for help. Anytime you have a relative or you yourself notice a change in your personality, you need to seek some kind of help from a mental health professional. You need not be a psychiatrist. There are other mental health professionals. There are counselors. There are psychologists. Uh, if parents notice this, too, in their children, that their personalities are changing, don't say, oh, they'll get over it. Uh, if you notice a consistent change, and a consistent change to me means, say, over a month of behaving in a, a, a changed way, yeah. they ought to seek help. Because at the early stages of helping people with mental health problems, the outlook is much, much better. So, uh, so I, I want to make a, a, a plug for that. You, we need to change our view of mental illness. We need to not be afraid of it and say, oh my, maybe he's getting a nervous breakdown. Let me not, let me not think about that. Let me not do anything about it. And we ought to take the bull by the horns and say, no, this is a change in personality, especially in young people. Yeah. I, I'm going to sort of take them, sometimes you may take them initially to a trusted family friend who will kind of confirm, yes, this yeah. is not the John I know or the Mag, you know, mm -hmm. Maggie. So, uh, that I know. So, so then what's, what's, what's the professional definition of a mental breakdown? The professional um, definition, that's so difficult to tell you or to, or to say it in, uh, without using it's very a broad. big, it's, it's broad. Oh, okay. But, the, but, but the, the, practical, the practical definition mm -hmm. is red flag should go up if the person shows a change in their person. What do I mean by that? Someone who used to be friendly and now is withdrawn. Uh, you know, yeah. th that, that should be a, a sign. Someone who is now going into their room every time they come home from school or from work and doesn't want to face people. 
that's what we mean by a change in personality. And um, these changes can be noticed even more uh, easily by family members rather than a professional. You just take your intuition too and, and see what's happening in family. Hey, this represents a change. Let me watch it. If a month passes and that is still going on, I would say you, but, but, you, but as I was saying, it's the stigma attached to mental illness that prevents people. They may notice the change, you know, but they yeah. feel no. They're afraid. They're afraid. They're afraid. And so um, that is why I think what one of the things that has happened in St. Martin is that um, the, the St. Martin Medical Center has been opened up for psychiatric care, especially in those early cases. Um, you know, people can come, uh, acute cases of, say, somebody um, attempting suicide. They can, they're seen at the St. Martin Medical Center and can be followed up afterwards. Because the more you integrate mental problems yeah. with other physical problems that people take care of, diabetes and so on, the more and more the stigma would be lessened. It may not go completely, but it will certainly, you certainly see a lessening of the stigma. And you, you are assigned right. to the St. Martin Medical Center? Yeah, there are two psychiatrists working at the St. Martin Medical Center. Years? Yes. Oh, okay. So that on a 24-7 uh, basis, the, the hospital is covered for any kind of psychiatric emergency. Oh. And, and I think that's, that's good, and that's yeah, a new development good. that has happened over the past 10 years in the island. Definitely. You know, the thing is that sometimes you hear people say, well, this person had a mental breakdown, and you're trying to figure out what it is because maybe a year later you see the person and they're all good again and so forth, and yes. that's the reason why I was asking mm -hmm. in, uh, earlier what it re what what it really was, you know, because right. it seems like it's so different for different people. Yeah, it is. That, that, that's a fact. But I think to be cautious, if you notice a change in personality, pay attention to it. Seek help. It may well be that in a year's time that person is, is good again, you know. Uh, and especially is that the case in people who are young people who are on uh, marijuana and, and uh, some of the other addictive drugs, uh, if they can get help early and come off of it, Mm -hmm. you will see that um, personality change kind of revert. They come back to the person they were. You're watching Speaking of Everything. I'm here speaking with uh, Dr. Jurgensen, a psychiatrist. She's now working with, work with the Simon Medical Center. Yes. And also the Turning Point. Yes. And uh -huh. also in, in your own private practice. Also. Right. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. And um, you, you work also with young people, I understand. Y yes. yes. There is, um, very fortunately, too, for St. Martin, I, I work mostly in the area of adult psychiatry, oh. but there's also a child psychiatrist. And there are not many islands that have a, a child psychiatrist. What's the name again? She was Dr. Ferrero. She's yes. still here? She, she's still here. Oh, okay. Yeah. And we work together at the St. Martin Medical Center. And um, that, that's a very good development for wow. St. Martin. And, and, and you were telling me earlier that um, with, with young people, it's still a big problem. And, and, uh, yes. And especially when. You told me during the break that a lot of young people today don't watch you in the face when they speak. Yeah, that's with. right. Now, um, when I said that to somebody, they said, you've got to watch how you talk about that. Because <laughs> in our culture, an adult may say, don't, don't look at me like that, you know, <laughs> and, and think it's a kind of um, rude for yeah. people. No, but I'm talking about that. I'm talking to you like we're yeah. doing now. Right. And so I look at you. Yeah. And I, 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 but you'll find young people, they're talking to you, and they're looking, um, they're looking away. That's an indication, too, of, of, of um, beginning, I don't want to say definite, but a beginning of loss of relational skills. Yeah. You know, because uh, you're supposed to engage a person when yeah, you talk with them. Back. Yeah. And uh, even when you watch teenagers talking among themselves, too, they, they hardly look at one another. Yeah. And um, this is a kind of, uh, it's not, you wouldn't say it's a big thing, but I think it's a significant thing. It, it kind of is one of the signs to us that things are not all right. Uh, some of the inspection that the expressions that teenagers use that they're cool, that they're safe, <laughs> but I am not so sure that em that can emotionally translate yeah. into well-being. That they can say, yeah, "Look, I'm doing all right with my, with my well-being." I don't have that much time, doctor. But is it? I only have over a minute, but I have to ask this question quickly. When it comes to young people, is it difficult prescribing medication, or they're reluctant to take it? Uh, it depends, because with a young person, for example, and um, Dr. Ferrero, the child psychiatrist, could tell you more about that, but you, you of course, have to... It's, it's usually a last measure in a young child that, that you will give them medication. And for young adults now, so 
mm -hmm. uh, late teens, early 20s. Right, the, 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 yeah. the, the population that I see mostly. Yes, it's difficult. It's difficult. They will take it in the crisis. If there's a crisis, they're not functioning well, especially if they can't sleep. You get oh. people to take medication for not sleeping. And so sometimes you know, your entry into uh, getting them to take medication, you say, hey, you know what? This will help you to sleep. They'll take it. But to continue, that's the thing. Because you see, much of the um, problems in psychiatry yeah. require that you do continue to take medication over a, a, a period. If you have pneumonia, once your pneumonia has cleared up, you stop taking medication. The x-ray is clear and that's it. But with psychiatric problems, you may, you may have to take medication for up to a year, and that is where people find it very difficult. I'm feeling well now. So they, Why do I need to take off. medication? <laughs> I can come off of it, but you come off too early, and the relapse. Wow. Uh, yes. Well, doctor, I, I want to thank you for coming in to be my guest this evening. Program. And you're welcome. And it's I my hope, pleasure. Thank you, and hope we can have you back again sometime soon. Sure. Uh, Dr. Yogerson, that's it for now. See you next time right here on Speaking of Everything. Until then, good night. Take care. Bye.